For more on financial stocks, we're joined now by Bloomberg Best and JMP Securities Analyst, head of U.S. Banks and Brokers Research there, David Trone. Dom also staying with us. David, let's start off with financials overall. With some of the bigger players, you've actually cut your forecast. And I was, I was surprised, Goldman Sachs, you cut your fourth quarter 2011 EPS forecast by 50 percent. Why? Yeah. Well, you know, the uh, the EU overhang is affecting all aspects of ca capital markets. You know, traders are, generally speaking, you know, sitting on their hands waiting to see uh, where that's going to go. Uh, investment banking, obviously, is impacted because market valuations are weak and customers are not coming to market with deals. So it's uh, it's a pretty uh, suppressed environment right now. And we also cut early into 212, 2012 because I think it'll continue. Now, there was some chatter out there in the blogosphere yesterday about uh, Goldman Sachs revisiting its entire business model. Is that something you take pretty seriously? And where would they go? Well, you know, if you look over the uh, the history of Wall Street, tr the trading part of the business is constantly evolving, and there's constant structural changes happening. That is happening now, obviously, with regulations, with what's happening to the what's happened to structured product markets. So I think Goldman and and their peers will rethink the the trading part of the business and try to restructure it to things that are more higher return. Well, David, one of the things that a lot of traders and analysts like yourself are looking at is this idea that these bank stress tests that the Fed is going to put on these banks, those submissions have to happen in the first part of January, and those results are going to be made public later on the quarter in, in yeah. towards the middle of March here. Are there expectations for any kind of real shoot drop here for the financials, or are these stress tests just a formality at this point? Well, I think it's very different than 09 when they started this process. I think it was a confidence builder at that time. And in fact, um, we needed some confidence raising, some capital raising to build confidence that the buffers were big enough. I don't think that's as, as much true today. I think it's basically just let's stay in this process. The EU crisis is making people a little skittish. Let's just reaffirm that the capital is sufficient. And I don't think you're going to see big um, requirements to raise capital after this stress test is, uh, is uh, put out. Let's talk about some of the uh, smaller players in the financial services industry. One that you actually like is a small brokerage firm, GCAP, which is certainly not one we talk about every day, but perhaps it's the under-the-radar yeah, financial yeah. companies that are the ones to buy. Well, well, exactly. I mean, the big firms are obviously very exposed to, whether directly or indirectly, to the EU, and it's very tough for, for investors to find a stock that they can really you know, have some confidence in right now. Um, and, and there are exceptions always, and, and GCAP is a retail uh, FX broker that is getting a lot of growth outside the U.S. Um, it, it sounds strange here in the U.S. to think about retail people trading FX, but outside the country, it's actually quite culturally normal and Especially it's been going Asia. on for many. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And so they have a tremendous amount of growth there. So they'll be the one stock that it's one stock that we actually uh, raise our estimates on. You call it a little bit controversial. Why is that? I mean, why is retail FX brokerage any different than trading in stocks or bonds? Well, the perception is that retail investors can't win when they trade FX and that they will just eventually just burn all their money and, and, and lose because the FX markets are very complicated and driven by institutional folks. Um, the empirical studies show that when people try to beat the market in fast trading on the retail side, not institutionally, but on the retail side, whether it's stocks, options, whatever it is, they eventually lose money. They just seem to be losing it uh, a little bit faster in FX. So that's why investors should buy and hold. Well, FX is also a leveraged market as well. So a lot of these trading shops boost the buying power of, say, a margin account by doing that. So it's quickly, it's, it's quick, you can quickly lose your shirt in a market like FX. Yeah. But that's the reason why the risk is there. But let's talk about some of these other smaller banking type players that you're talking about in the U.S. here. Are there other traditional banks that you find appealing? And what is the common theme among those that makes it such an, an appealing trade? Well, you know, I think Dodd-Frank and uh, the consumer finance regulations particularly makes it very difficult for traditional banks. You know, the smaller banks typically only had two fee incomes. It was the debit card and the overdraft, and both of those have gotten hit very hard. And we don't have loan growth. Uh, margins are squeezed by, by zero rates. So we, we prefer names like Lazard, Evercore, the advisory names where, yes, m and is not great right now, but it's not that bad, and you have some countercyclical things like restructuring fees that you can get if things you know, get worse. And they also have asset management businesses, which are pretty stable. Some of those that might qualify sort of for the smaller cap space. Sure. Yeah. All right. When do you buy the big banks? Very quickly. When you get a EU resolution, All they're right. gonna they're gonna jump hard. Not today. I would not I would not be underweight though as a result. Okay. It's gonna happen fast. David, such a pleasure to have you here on In the Loop. Thanks so much for joining us this Thank morning. You. That was David Trone, a Bloomberg best.